Um, here we, today we are talking about some ideas within the controversies in literature for children. Particularly, I focused on an overview of looking at the interpretive and hidden controversies within children's literature. There are many ways that we find controversies ex exist. And the three particular ways in which I have chosen to look at this have been looking at the historical representations and how the historical, our perceptions of historical things have changed over time. Sociocultural context and changes in accepting the norms that are um, considered to be uh, part of our public conversations. And the third is in things that are supposedly hidden within our society that are made public, either knowingly or um, through interpretation. So with that as a focus, I have taken a look at how a few of these categories can be explained. My first example is one of the Laura Ingalls Wilder Little House series, which is widely known in the United States and I believe also in some countries outside. But one of the things about this widely familiar um, series, which in the first 70 years of its publication sold over 60 million copies, is the over-romanticization of the past, as if the past were a time in which we could be nostalgic and think about ways that things would have been had we lived in that time period. What we see is that Ma is always serene, calm with some fears, but Pa is able to play his fiddle, sing, and to bring reassurances to his family. The focus is on adventure and very little on survival. What we find is that there are degrees of self-censorship even in the writing of it. Laura herself as the author did not, for example, talk about the ways in which her family left town in the middle of the night one time and fled because there were debtors waiting or um, the fact that they had a baby that they lost in, the will, in a very uh, disheartening scene. But so as an author, she practiced self-censorship. But what has come into more focus in recent times is the ways in which the author talks about the what they call the savage Indians and the way the way that the Indians are perceived as being wild people who are to be feared in the midst of it all. And it's the kindness of straight white people that makes it more acceptable. In addition to that, what we find is the social cultural context in which hidden things become um, more on a widely prominent level. For example, what you see here are two books about police violence in the United States, All American Boys and um, The Hate You Give. In both of these, what we find is stories that are well known within a particular community suddenly becoming more known outside of their own communities and the resistance against them when people believe that these are um, indoctrinations against police and the things like that. But the sociocultural context of today, despite the very difficult times that have been brought to us in the pandemic, is that people are objecting. People are fighting against these um, hidden things of the past by saying, yes, we're, we're willing to get out there and fight against the problems that we see. So sociocultural context is enormous in taking a look at what has happened. But this is not new. The organization Black Lives Matter started in 2013 when Trayvon Martin's killer was acquitted on the police force. And with that began a much more widely um, recognized context for police violence and the tragedies that it ensues. The Ways in which we look at the controversies in literature for children can be found in the following locations. The first were the whys and these are the wheres. Where is it that we find these controversies? A quick overview will tell you that some of it is in the book, but sometimes in the people that are involved, whether it be the creator, editor, or reviewer, seller, buyer, but then also in circumstantial um, places like in social media, with an adult intermediary, intermediary or through a reader response. What I like to do is go through those areas one by one. First of all, when we take a look at controversies in text, because we have in the world some people who are uh, looking to see where there are ways in which they can object, objections occur when the perceived um, controversy is in the eye of the beholder or the eye of the reader mind of the reader. For example, in this book, Bridge to Terabithia by Katherine Patterson, a Hans Christian Andersen award-winning, widely internationally translated author, 
There are two instances in which the word dam is used. I've included them both here. As you can tell, they're both culturally contextual in that this is a situation in which two best friends have a very tight bond, but when one is killed in an accident that the other one feels could have been avoided by uh, his actions, the extreme emotion is played out with word dam twice. Once when it talks about how God will damn you and the other to talk about what a foolish thing he has done to have an extreme. It's a punctuation. Catherine Patterson, um, daughter of a missionary, a missionary herself, and a very um, devout Christian, found it a, a way in which you want to communicate through particular text. And yet this is a book that is widely um, seen as being controversial because of the inclusion of particular texts. Sometimes the controversies come in the illustrations. For example, what you see here is Dr. Seuss books that are still in publication and considered very controversial. And many of you know the work of, of course, um, Philip Nell, the one who wrote the book about Is a Cat in the Hat Black? But the research that we have seen is that Dr. Seuss rarely included people, but when he did, they were through racist caricatures. These caricatures still exist and are still being published and still being read by children. Should we be continuing to have illustrations that are controversial such as this shown? Sometime the um, controversy exists in the translation. I could spend hours on just this one issue alone, but let me give you only one example. Here you see the cover of two books. The original is in Japanese, and it's um, Hirosh the Hiroshima bombing story that you read is the original. You notice that there's a very ghost of a boy over the, the English um, version cover is on the right-hand side. The boy and the ghost are not shown, and an inside spread shows the ghost boy. The translator has decided to remove the voice of the narrator. The original is narrated entirely through this young child who has died in the bombing. That alone creates a personal connection to the child reader in that we're looking through a voice of someone who can no longer humanly exist in this world. Such a powerful device of storytelling. And yet what we find in the English translation is that the removal and making it more of a nonfiction factual statement takes it away from a personal narration to being fact-based sentences. Again, if we, this would be a place in which I would tell you much more if we could, but we will go on to talk about more broadly the other ways in which we find um, objections and controversies. The creator can often also be found as the source of a controversy that exists, the author or it may be the illustrator. Sherman Alexie is one who has won many awards in the United States in recent times because of his depiction of Native American stories. Among the highest um, recognitions is the one that is created by the American Indian Library Association, and they had awarded him the Book of the Year Award for an enormously popular book called The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. However, following the Me Too kinds of implications, following the um, the recognition that Sherman Alexie, in fact, was in violation of human rights and women's rights and all of that, the organization chose to rescind his award to send him an unequivocal message that his actions are not acceptable. Sometimes the um, objection and controversy comes from the editing and publishing and then has an outcome that goes toward a wider population. What we see here is the book, A Birthday Cake for George Washington. And even before the book came to publication, it was sent out for review and the reviewers themselves raised the notices of what was happening in the publishing world. Is it appropriate to have slaves that are race, uh, slaves that are shown as smiling and happy? And the biggest problem that we find with this is that the editor said, yes, slaves had moments in which they were happy. And the publisher, Scholastic, initially said, we are going to stand behind our book. Yet when people protested the idea that, in fact, this very slave who cooked this um, birthday cake, in fact, later did run away. And in running away, had to leave his daughter behind. The 
controversy existed over the overly jovial explanation, the simplistic showing of one particular event, and the lack of truth by repeatedly ignoring the difficulties of slavery. So therefore, the editing and publishing became an issue in this case. Reviews can be ones that point out controversy as well. The American Indians in Children's Literature website is founded and run by Debbie Reese, a scholar in the area of children's literature and in Native American studies. In her website, she makes clear what it is that one should look for if you are not yourself of Native American heritage, that you can take a look at these books and see it from a particular perspective. When we find a book that is being objected to, what you will see here is that the book cover is crossed out, widely written, not recommended, but then a very detailed analysis of why an American Indian has objected to the particular book and its portrayal of the Native Americans. So reviews have played this as well. In the reviews, what we find is that buyers sometimes create or um, hide various controversies by the ways in which they market the materials. What we see here is a Barnes & Noble exhibit. I was going through all of my photos trying to find this one photo because I had taken a photo of it myself. But when I couldn't find it, I did a Google search and immediately came across two different ways in which the um, booksellers it show you a particular way of looking at the books. One is celebrating black history, which um, has come under some people's question about such things as, but what about the other 11 months? Do we only look at black history in one month out of a year? But more problematic for me is when they segregate books throughout the year in a section called African American interest, as if this would only be of a particular interest and not more widely integrated across the bookstore. Social media plays an important role in these days. And through social media, books can find enormous success or sometimes a um, rejection from a public. Sophie Blackhall created the illustrations in a fine dessert in which we have smiling slaves. And people had objected to this through her um, blog site, but when she started removing the comments of anyone who was making an objection, there became a public outcry on Facebook and on Twitter saying, you cannot silence the people who object without responding to them. And through this, it became a social media fiasco in which one looked at how the book A Fine Dessert dis again depicted those who are um, of slavery. Again, this could be an entire longer conversation. Adult intermediaries are enormous in how they be act as the gatekeepers regarding things that are of controversies. Librarians are known for selecting things as choices that people can make in the school library. Teachers on how they teach a particular book, parents and how they make selections for the children's recreational reading, but also watch groups. I'd like to focus our, a few comments on two particular things here. One is on teachers. Research has shown that even when a teacher says, oh, yes, I'm including books about diversity, I have, in fact, read the book, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, with my students. A researcher who went into the classroom and wrote down every question the teacher asked, every discussion point that was made following the reading aloud of this book over weeks, found that the teacher focused questions on relationship between the mother and son behavior of the son, ways in which peer-to-peer -peer interactions were had, all things that felt comfortable perhaps to the teacher and the teacher's background, not being African-American. However, what's most important about this book from a more sociocultural perspective is the history of the time, 1963, a time of church bombings, a time of the Ku Klux Klan, and a time in which in particular three black children died as a result of hatred that was had at that time. If the teacher never asked the questions, never raised those points, never brought them into the discussion to be had, that is a different kind of controversy than the controversy in the book in itself. A two-layered kind of controversy, the controversy that was within the book that is about a historical time, but the controversy that the teacher chose not to bring it to the attention of the students and to discuss it with them. The next point I want to raise is on um, watch groups that are out there. 
PEBIS is known as Parents Against Bad Books in Schools. This kind of organization widely says parents have the ultimate right to decide what children should read, and therefore they will go through every controversial book that they deem as being controversial and mark them by page, word, paragraph, exactly where a word is used, a comment is made, an allusion is found regarding things that parents can find objectionable. So adults can be a major part in playing in looking at controversies. The next part is on taking a look at reader response. This is a book that is, oddly enough, very widely translated around the world. And you get two very opposing responses to this particular book. There are some who think this is the ultimate um, book in showing how giving one should be, to give without um, any cause of thinking about ways in which you can be selfish, to give selflessly. On the other hand, there are others who say, no, in fact, this is personified as a male tree, I'm sorry, a male child, a female tree. In the English version, it is very clear that it's a male child and a female tree, which I know that in some translated countries, that is different because of the noun genders and all of that. But in the case, the boy ends up killing the tree after the tree has given and given and given. So again, this kind of very contrasting look at how readers respond creates a controversy as well. These issues are sometimes very um, within a book and sometimes extended into a more wider audience. And I'd like to take a look at which sometimes how those hidden issues can become public, either intentionally or implied or through how we interpret them. The first one is rather intentional. It's a way in which there's purposeful writing and illustrating to make a point. The title alone will tell you that this is something that is intentional. Daddy's roommate, Heather has two mommies, and Tango makes three. These are ways in which they're saying, we have an issue, we want to talk about them, and we're putting them front and center in, in the title of a book that is about a particular topic. In all three of these cases, addressing ideas of LGBTQ, they have been found to be both books that are widely acclaimed as well as widely censored. Sometimes the controversies are implied. It's not in the title. It's not even overtly explained, but sometimes we find them through the way the story is explained. Julianne is a Mermaid is also a book that is about a child who expresses um, himself through a female personification or identity, and yet it doesn't overtly come out and say that in the title unless you read between the lines or look at the illustrations more closely. Or in the case of The Journey of Oliver Woodman, a book in which we have a family made up of two different races, but nowhere in the text does it say so. It's only when you look closely at the illustrations that you see the implications of a mixed race child. The third area in which we look at um, how one finds controversies that are hidden is in the ways that we interpret them. Frog and Toad and that whole series by Arnold Lobel were written in the 1970s. And at that time, I was a school librarian and a parent objected to the book saying that they were examples of a way in which we teach young children to have gay relationships. But in fact, it was not ever explicit and it was only four years after the books came out that Arnold Lobel himself came out as a gay person. And then people started reading more interpretively into what they saw in the illustrations rather than what had been uh, understood before. So again, a matter of interpretation as to whether there's a controversy that some perceive or not. The American Library Association has been very much of a leader in taking a look at what we need for intellectual freedom. In 1965, the ALA established an Intellectual Freedom Committee, and with that committee, later turned into an office called the Office of Intellectual Freedom, and they have fought against all kinds of ways in which we have the right to read, freedom to read, but also freedom of privacy of what we read. Librarians have been the head of being um, against the Patriot Act here in the United States, in which 
Um, governments have said, we have the right to know what kinds of books your patrons are reading. And in fact, libraries have said, no, you do not have the right to know as a government the privacy of what an individual chooses to check out from the library. The Office of Intellectual Freedom has initiated what we call the Banned, Challenge, Banned and Challenge Books, Banned Books Weeks, as a result. What we find here is every year they come up with two graphics that they show you what were the most challenged books of the previous year, and what are the statistics as to who initiated challenges, the reasons why those challenges exist, what types of materials have been um, objected against, and so forth. And you can easily find these materials on the American Library Association site. As you see from the 10 books that made the most challenged books of 2019, most are books for children. This is a closer look at the content that is objected. And in, when they took a look at analyzing the words that most frequently came up, you can see here in the proportions in which they are darker and bolder print and larger, the reasons why the books were in fact challenged by the readers. The number one banned book of the year was about a transgender protagonist, George, by Alex Gino. But when they wrote the book, George, there was this sense that Alex was able to express a personal story, but the number of readers who have said, if I had been able to read this book as a child, I might not have felt so strange, or I finally found a book in which I feel that my identity has been one that I can seek in a character in a book. This is a book that was highly banned and also, as you can see from the sticker and the award on the cover, highly acclaimed at the same time. Banned Books Week is coming up very soon, so appropriate for our conversation today, as we take a look at what are the books that people are banning, what are the books that people are questioning, and what are the books that we should, in fact, hold up and read. When we take a look at what it is that books, find, books are controversial, I think the notion that I keep returning to myself is this idea. Books are only controversial to those who recognize them as so. History has told us that finding controversy in books has been something that has been done over and over and over. And yet we also see the detrimental effects of those who have found controversy in books. I find it heartening to take a look at those who say, for example, in the New York Times, Perry Klaus, a well-known um, writer for educational issues with children, say, here are the banned books your child should read. Or on a different side, I found 25 banned books um, to read with your kids tonight. So encouraging parents to take a look at what is it that the world is banning and how we can, in fact, take a look at them together and see what we can do about um, books that are being banned and make um, decisions about what we believe should be controversial and should not. This is the first time that I have um, put together this research and um, a quick overview for all of you. I apologize again that we cannot be together so that we can have a face-to-face -face conversation on this. But what I would like to do at this point is to stop my screen sharing and go back to Mateusz to ask whether you have some questions that you would like to raise. So, Mateusz? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Junko, thank you so much for this amazing, very interesting <laughs> lecture. Uh, it was a pleasure, as always, listening to you. Um, and I, I'm sure that there are some questions if there are no questions, I do have questions, but um, I, but I'm sure that, there, oh, we already have um, the first question. What was the name of the book with a transgender protagonist? That's the first question. George. George. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I travel with um, 20 teenagers to Japan every year, every other year, students who are studying Japanese, high school students from my local community. This past year, out of 20, four were transgendered, identified as the pronoun they, mm -hmm. four out of our 20. I think that this is a subject that to not talk about them in literature is to deny people who have an identity a sense of self. So I, you know, I feel personally very strongly about 
this kind of controversy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We're waiting for some more questions. And while we're waiting, I, I do want to make one statement in that I knew that I was the first in this series of speakers. So I presented more broadly about the broad strokes about where controversies exist. But every slide I thought I could go deeper and deeper into some in particular. And my original talk that I would have given had we been face to face in March was much more focused on the translation side of it all. But I also then began to realize how very narrowly focused that would have been to only talk to you about places in which I saw translators creating controversy through the ways in which they have made some choices. So again, but that's for another time. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for questions. You can raise your hand or um, write your question down in the chat. Okay, we have the next question. A lot of parents and teachers think reading controversial books to children will confuse or even mislead young children. What do you think? What's the meaning of reading controversial books to children? That's the next okay. question. <laughs> if I understood that quick, I was also kind of sidebar reading Michelle Martin's, yeah. um, which I think is absolutely spot on that Shel Silverstein, in fact, was a writer for Playboy and a writer of adult um, cartoons and such. So I think that's a very good recognition that she put out there for us. Um, what is the meaning of reading controversial books for children, I believe, is what you are asking me. And I would say that we as the adults the gatekeepers, if you will, we're the ones who make decisions about what we want our children to be exposed to, whether they're our own personal children or the children in front of us as a classroom teacher, as a librarian, the children we serve in our communities. And I think we have different degrees of comfort in which one would say, yes, I want my child exposed to anything in print to, no, I'm very protective about anything my child has access to. So I would say that as a parent, I will look at this from the perspective of a parent. As a parent, I wanted my daughter to have access to anything she wanted to see in print because within the house, I could talk to her about it, my perspective about it, and to be able to give her feedback and to let her talk about the things that she questioned in life in general. So. As a parent, I was much more open about the ways in which I had controversial potential, well, what some people would consider controversial, um, as being ways of expanding our minds. Um, as a teacher, I think it's a different kind of responsibility. If you are a public school teacher, you have an obligation to those who are your employers, in fact, the people in the, pub in the general public. So you know your own community, and you know what is... Um, the norms within that community for what is controversy and what is not. But for me, literature has been a way in which we broaden the experiences we do not know ourselves. They are not our own lived experiences, and therefore, literature helps us to have insights into others. So that would be a reason to have a book that someone else might ban being something that I might bring into discussion. My personal objection is violence on screen. I have a very big personal bias against anything that I believe to be unnatural acts of violence toward one another. And so, but that is what happens on screen, which I feel like you cannot control. So we as human beings, as adults, all have biases about what we consider to be controversial. Absolutely. We have more questions, which makes me really happy. Uh, next question. How controversy is related to ideology as defined and investigated by Peter Hollandale and John Stevens. So controversy and ideology. That's the question that Krzysztof Rybak has asked. I'm, I'm not sure I have a very good straightforward answer to that one and someone else might want to join this conversation as well. But obviously in our world, we do have different sets of ideologies. And that does guide what we decide is in fact controversial. And just like one of my last slides said, um, books are controversial only to those who recognize them as so. That does imply that the ideologies with we operate guide 
the decisions we make about what we consider to be controversial. Would anyone else like to um, join in with a different response to that or to add to that? No? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, we have more questions. Okay, somebody can raise their hand and say something. <laughs> uh, it's like school, you know? no one wants to. I'm being questioned on some witness stand or something, <laughs> but yes. Okay. Uh, could you say a bit more about translation controversies as it is perhaps more subtle? That's the question that Evelyn Arisbe has asked. This has been a research area of mine for a long time. And for over 20 years of my career, closer to 30 years of my career, I have been worried about the ways in which translations make it from one country to another, applauding, of course, that coming from a lesser known language like Japanese into a more widely read language like English is both to be applauded, but then what you realize is that you're perpetuating ways of thinking and believing because you're relying on the third creator, the translator, who then, in fact, makes the original story their, the translator's voice in what is understood. Now, we all know that through translation theories, there are many reasons in which um, people, the translators make decisions. But the ones that bother me the most are the ones that I find are changing perceptions, mm -hmm. and changing perceptions of um, history. And in particular, books about Hiroshima are the ones I consistently find that translators change words, change entire um, voices, like in the, in the um, example of the ghosts. But most of all, what we find is that um, translators put their own beliefs about historical events, their own interpretations into how they make that story available to a new audience. Again, you know, if we had a lot of time, I could give you very specific examples in which that happens. But um, I think that this is a research area that can have impact on policies and, and particular ways in which translations go forward as we try to have more and more um, people bringing translations into a public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there instances where you see censorship as justified? Can we justify censorship? That's the next question that we have in the meeting chat. There, censorship is in many degrees. The one wide, widest degree that we typically think of is censorship in which someone tries to make, um, in, in the particular case of books, a book not available to all the particular audience. In other words, to make, take a book out of publication, to keep a book from publication, to make sure a public library doesn't purchase a book, you know, things like that. On the other hand, there is self-selection, self-censorship. And as I alluded to with Laura Ingalls Wilder, self-censoring her own life story and choosing what she wanted to write about in the same way a librarian has a way of making self-censorship. Um, I was a school librarian and I obviously made choices about what books I was going to spend the school budget on to put into the library. My beliefs as a human being, as a teacher, as an adult who is influencing the reading material of children guided how I spent that money. In some ways, it can be seen as a form of self-censorship that's known as selection. So, and that's the part that's the grayest and the hardest to find out. Did, in fact, the librarian make the decision not to buy a particular book for a library because it was potentially controversial? Or did the librarian not buy a particular book for a library because there were other ways to spend that limited budget for different kinds of books? But from self-censorship to a larger um, public censorship is such a wide range that I can't give a blanket answer to no, there's never a reason, or yes, there's always a reason. It, the answer lies somewhere in the, in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we have more questions. When reevaluating themes in well-loved children's literature, what do you believe is, best, is the best outcome for the discussion? How useful are retrospective studies? That's uh, Rosie G's question. Retrospective studies 
are mind expanding for all of us who are researchers. We learn a lot. We learn through our thought processes how we analyze and how I look at a book and how I um, critique it, how I make ways of doing an analysis of it is largely dependent on the tools that I have built through um, years of doing analytical research. What impact does it make on today's readership is a different story. When it's about books that are commonly read still, for example, the Dr. Seuss books, that has a very wide implication. It has a wide implication because people can um, continue to perpetuate images by celebrating books that are that we know to be controversial by saying, oh, but it's still a good book about, or but it's such a good book for children to practice their reading with, or whatever reason they come up with, books that still continue to be widely out there. I think we have a social responsibility, if you will, as researchers to make our research public in ways that challenge the um, decision-making of teachers, librarians, parents, publishers, and others who are continuing to celebrate books that are demeaning, um, derogatory, and inciting racism, in fact, or other ways in which we are closing our minds, hearts, and attitudes about the world. So historical as one way of looking at it, but also historical that, Im that impacts today's publishing and readership. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the line in using or not using beautifully written books by problematic authors such as Alexi or more recently Diaz or J.K. Rowling? <laughs> where, I'm sorry, the first part of that again, where do I see? Where do you see the line in using, not using beautifully written books? So I think that the, the author of this uh, question wants to know, should we read their books in class? Should we encourage children to, to read these books or should we focus on um, the authors and not on the, 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 the texts yeah, of the books? Nothing ever has a straightforward answer you'll find, but I, agree. I believe that if I were teaching young children, I would make one kind of decision based on how much time I had with them, who those children were, and how capable I felt in being able to scaffold discussions. On the other hand, I have another response for uh, myself and probably most of the other people who are here with us today, which is as scholars who teach adults who then make decisions about what they're going to do. In many cases, the bad example makes a point much more clearly than vaguely talking about what's good. Only. And so bad examples, in fact, are important. I used to say that in my university office were two extremes of books, excellent books that I really wanted to teach about and horrible books that I wanted to teach about because the two extremes made for much stronger teaching possibility than mediocre books. And so as an adult scholar and researcher, I would absolutely say yes, we should teach the bad example and why it's bad. I learned more from going to Debbie Reese's American Indian site by finding out why does she not recommend something? When I read what she says about why she does not recommend, it's such a learning experience for me. And when Michelle Martin here tells us on the sidebar her running commentary on several different things she's brought up here. I learn from them. When I read from Sarah Park Dolan's um, research, especially through her um, online journal that she's editing, I learn so much from others that negative examples are powerful in how they help formulate our thinking. Does mm -hmm. that answer yeah. some of the questions? <laughs> there, I think there are a few questions about censorship and... Maybe I'll read the one by Camilla. What do you think of the correlation between censorship and dictatorial regimes, or if not dictatorial or from extreme ideologies? Why do you think literature and specifically children's literature is affected by censorship? I think that you have already talked about censorship, but there's something that you, you want to add. Dictator um, regimes 
is that many of us don't have access to the children's books that are published in those regimes very easily. I will say that in earlier times, I think it was in 1994, in fact, when I first went to China and saw the school libraries in China and the publishing industry that was there at the time, heavily, of course, under communist um, stipulations as to what was being published, I saw a very um, purposeful publishing industry that had that used children's books as a way of indoctrinating people. But if you look historically back at probably most of our countries, <laughs> wasn't that a part of what children's books origin was? And so I don't think that we can particularly finger point at saying one does it worse than others, except that maybe one continues more than others. But I, I don't think I can answer that question very easily because I have not lived under countries in which such strong um, dictators existed. Well, I'm on the question what's happening anywhere in the United States or Japan right now, but um, I, don't, I don't think I can easily answer that particular one. I think that, again, it all goes back to the it depends answer, I'm sorry to say. Does, if anyone else has something they would like to add on a more informed um, experience, I would be happy to hear that too. Yeah. Um, usually while talking about controversies, um, we focus on the themes, the topics, uh, real response. Are there any other qualities uh, that make books controversial? Well, it depends on how we define controversial. And if we're not going to talk about the content of the book, and we're not going to talk about the response, and we're not going to talk about the adult intermediary, the seller, the, you know, all those things that I already talked about in my presentation, yeah. for me, there are different kinds of controversies that we have, which is largely based on access. And the fact that access has become even more important during this pandemic. When I think about the fact that there are children who are always going to have access to more resources. And when they're denied the access to public libraries, public schools and their resources, and they're having to rely on their parents to be able to buy, to be able to furnish, to be able to read aloud and do all those things, we're creating a divide. And this is a controversy that is here now and in our faces. And I worry about the future for an entire year or more in which we make this divide even larger. When I see parents who have the means to do this, hiring tutors, buying whatever their, their children need to have access to in terms of books and materials. And then those who don't have access to basic needs in life right now, who are really suffering and how we will recover from this kind of controversy of who has access to books, readers, teachers, and more during this time of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. You've made a very good point. You know, it's a very worrisome point right now. I, I sincerely worry about this. I've heard about countries that are saying this is a not, a not year for children. We're not going to have school this year for children. And so therefore, everyone will repeat a grade starting next year. And I think that's so much fair mm -hmm. to school children to say we're all going to start this next year over rather than everyone's going to muddle through and whatever resources they can have. And lucky for you, if you have access to books and, you know, parents will read them to you or guide you through this. So. Yeah. We have one more question about translating. How can translators avoid having their own cultural and societal norms cloud their judgment of controversial elements as they might not be controversial to the translators uh, themselves? Any tips, perhaps? And thank you for a very interesting lecture. You know, it's always been interesting to me that when it comes to facts of science, 
facts of mathematics and things like that that are factual information, they always do fact check. They always have somebody say, could you read this for accuracy? But in translation, it's time for us to have, and maybe they, they do have this in some places, but not all, um, to say, please take a look at the translation, the original, and give us feedback in terms of how you perceive this translation to have worked and so forth. But um, in, at least in the case of Japanese, and in the case with translation into English, which is the only one I can talk about with any um, particular knowledge, Japanese is such a lesser known language that the editor in the, in the United States or in other English language countries don't typically also speak Japanese or can read the original. So they have to completely rely on the expertise of the translator to give it the final word. If we make this controversy known, which I believe is the more utilitarian purpose of making research on controversial materials public, is if we can make editors and publishers aware that these kind of translation controversies exist, mm -hmm. then maybe they will say, I'm going to hire a fact checker, if you will, or somebody else to give us a reader response before they take it into print, an advisory person. That could be a hope, but um, recognizing that you could potentially have a bias, I think, is the first. Mm -hmm. So if tr I don't know what kind of translation schools there are for people to say, I want to learn to be a translator, and I recognize that there are these controversies, and I doubt my own ability to do this, so I'm going to look for my own feedback person. Because all of us who are researchers know that we have our own inner circles. We have people we trust to say, can you take a look at this data and give me some feedback on how I've analyzed it? We have a way of triangulating the ways in which we analyze material. I'm not sure that it happens in publishing. I know that, for example, in the case of Japanese to English, what happens is because so few people speak Japanese, the, the publishing company will put together what they call a rough translation. And then the editor in the American publishing house will simply clean up that into making it more literary text or something like that. And so when there's no translator named on a book, it means that the translation was done from in-house to in-house without a professional translator being a part of the process. That, of course, is a different kind of controversy altogether. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. It's definitely controversial. <laughs> the role of the translator, uh, which is often taken for granted or dismissed, we uh, quite often do not think about the translators, their names are not on the covers, uh, which is often terrible. Really. And when the role of the translator is held up as being more important within a culture, then you have hire highly competent people who go into translation. For example, in Japan, a translator is seen as being very important to the process. Always proudly named as this book has been translated by, and then someone who has a name known as a translator. And because of that status of translation, often well-known writers themselves become translators. Now that person's reputation is at stake. If that person's reputation is at stake, they're, of course, going to make sure that they go through all the checks and balances to figure out whether or not their translation is, in fact, worthy of that kind of reputation they want to uphold. So it's raising the status of translators that might be the first point of entry in some of this. And the fact that we recognize translators should just not be two people, uh, someone who speaks two different languages, but rather knows culturally both languages and also the children's literature from both countries and both you know cultures so yeah you surely have to be qualified to be a good translator <laughs> it's not that yeah. easy <laughs> but it doesn't always happen that way <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah okay so uh okay i don't think that we have any more questions we have some some more great comments by the way um i would like to thank you all for all of these great comments in, in the, the meeting chat i've managed to read all of them and i've learned a lot not only uh from your great lecture but also from from all of these great comments so we really appreciate them yeah. i'm looking forward to participating in all of the future um yeah. sessions 
of the Congress. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Junko, thank you so much for this great lecture. And I would like to thank all of uh, the participants. And um, we're looking forward to seeing you next month. It was a great meeting. So thank you very much, Junko. And uh, thank you uh, all listeners who joined us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>